Ladies and gentlemen, welcome wrestling fans worldwide to Knoxville and the Great Smoky Mountains for the Ron Fuller Tennessee Studcast. Six feet nine inches tall, 265 pounds. This historic podcast from one of the most respected and successful wrestlers and promoters will follow the footsteps of the largest and oldest wrestling family on the planet. Listen to what I'm saying. That's right. Bring that camera in here a little bit closer. Through 93 years and four Four generations. The stud has arrived. Old school or new fan, this unique broadcast will educate and captivate as Ron details decades of professional wrestling's growth with truly unforgettable stories. I want those people out there at home to hear the stud. Sit back and enjoy the ride with the Tennessee stud. The Tennessee stud. You will learn that name, you will remember it. And now, the stud is here. Hey everybody, welcome in. It's David Summers hosting another Studcast with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. This is the story of wrestling in America as told by the stud, whose family started the profession over 100 years ago. So, let's get back into the ring and back into time as we get wall to wall and tree top tall with the Tennessee stud, Ron Fuller. Hey, Ron, I got to tell you, I watched what I thought was a really interesting movie Sunday afternoon. I think it was Sunday afternoon, and it was raining, so I thought, let's do a movie. So I found a movie that was called uh, Iron Claw. It was the story of the Von Erich family. And, man, it was two hours long. It was one of the most depressing things I've ever seen. Now, it was it was interesting because they were an interesting family, but the the tragedy, and they called it the Von Erich curse. I just thought, wow, how did the man? And only one of those sons remains, and that is Kevin. And he was the oldest, and he is 67 years old now. Uh, man, it's a tragic story. You're right. I um, mean, a horrible, really horrible story. Uh, uh, my brother and Jimmy knew those guys quite well, worked with the, the some of the younger boys. Uh, I only met David, uh, and that was uh, probably about uh, two months before he died in Japan. Uh, uh, met David one time, uh, spending spending the night uh, uh, hanging around in Las Vegas. In fact, we were at a National Wrestling Alliance convention, and uh, we hung out together and went to see a Siegfried and Roy show. Wow. Wow. And uh, two months later, he died. Man, that's it's. Uh, I know you you've heard the story down the line over over the years, and uh, do you call it a curse? I mean, wow, what the what those uh, that what those boys went through. Oh man, tell it's a uh, you know yeah. I don't I don't think there's a better way of putting it <laughs> rather than it just being a curse. Uh, you know, and 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 the one is still alive. He lives in Hawaii. And uh, and he, he's he must be living the life of Riley. He's doing well, I'm sure. He yeah, it, it, wonderful by, thing. Yeah, by all accounts, it, it does seem like uh, the oldest son Kevin is is doing really well. All right, let's get into it. So your stud cast Ron are on a real roll. Besides pushing the numbers of listeners to a new level, the content of what you're doing now is absolutely remarkable. The three cards discussed in the last stud cast occurred in three different decades. Your father's match with Rocky Marciano refereeing was in the 1960s. Your NWA world title match with the legendary Harley Race, that was in the 70s, of course. And then the Southeastern card, we went right into the 1980s. You had three Texas death matches on that Southeastern card in the 1980s. That was really cool. Yeah, well, it should have given fans a, a little taste of what professional wrestling was all about during that 30-year period of time. Actually, you know, the 1965 Marciano match with Mario Galento uh, against my dad took place in the baseball stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. Had more than 20,000 fans there. Uh, then you had uh, the NWA world title match that I had with Arlie in 1973 in Miami in the Florida Territory. Uh, obviously that one sold out and turned away, turned away a whole lot of people. And then you had the three Texas death matches on one card, uh, sold out every major arena in the Southeastern Gulf coast territory. 
So professional wrestling was doing very well, man, uh, over almost the entire country, but was truly on fire all over the South for sure, except maybe for Knoxville area. <laughs> all right. All right our, our, if I remember correctly, last week, on the end of the studcast, you said something about starting a new weekly segment to carry us back to the southeastern Tennessee territory by giving us an idea of what their cards were like compared to what was happening on the Gulf Coast. Because obviously, you had already left Knoxville by then, so we really don't know what was happening after you left. So where exactly are we going to be riding this week on this studcast? Well, I think I'm, in, I'm going to take this week's uh, Hidden History lesson uh, and going to do it about the other Southeastern Territory, the one in Knoxville. We haven't talked much about that in the last uh, four or five months. And, uh, and it is where, basically, I got my start as an owner of a territory and a place where, man, I, I still have the very best memories of those days. I was so sorry to see what was happening there after I left at the end of 1979. So we're going to talk about two Knoxville cards, one Southeastern card and the other, that Knoxville Five, still in business there. We're going to talk about their card. And they were in the same week of June 1980 as the Gulf Coast card that we're going to be talking about later as well. So there was a tremendous amount of hidden history regarding what was going on there. And that, that was making it so difficult to to bring success back to that part of the country. So we will discuss that before turning our attention south, obviously, uh, to another red-hot card along on the Gulf Coast down there. And we will do the Cards TV show and the results of the matches and the attendance. And then hopefully we'll have another, another time, uh, another chance for a learning tree question, man. We've been getting some in. I've been really happy with that. Yeah, I hope we can. All right, so I'm looking forward to this discussion of what happened to the Georgia wrestling companies that bought you out and why they had such a difficult time building back what you had created. As, as you know, you had incredible television ratings. You had big crowds in the arena in Knoxville. So I'm curious, where do we start this thing? Well, let's start with the new Southeastern Knoxville owners, Jim Barnett and Fred Ward. Uh, they were out of Georgia. Both of them had promoters in Georgia. Barnett uh, handled uh, basically Atlanta North, and and uh, and, Bar and uh, Fred Ward was down there in Columbus and Macon, Georgia, and in the South Georgia area. And then we're, we'll we'll discuss the Knoxville's Five, the All Star Company card, and uh, they're still there, and uh, and like I said, they were obviously there and still having matches. So before I give you the two June Knoxville cards, I want to go back and I want to discuss what happened there since the fall of 1979, which was about seven months uh, after the Georgia promoters uh, bought me out, uh, you know, uh, and uh, this is uh, this is true hidden history, man. The, the, for the Knoxville fans, uh, had no idea of what was going on, uh, you know, behind the scenes, who had bought it, what was happening. So the first mistake the Georgia promoters made was not considering the popularity of the Southeastern wrestlers that we had developed over the five years that I owned that company. Uh, they knew my talent was very good uh, compared to everybody said that we were, we were pretty, uh, pretty much uh, uh, in line with most of the big corp big companies and the big uh, territories, but uh, they never expected that uh, they were going to have such a hard time building wrestlers to take the place of the ones that we had uh, while we were there. So they also underestimated the fans' appreciation of what they had been seeing for that five-year period of time. Uh, Jim Barnett, as an example, had run extremely successful reps territories all over the world, not just in America, Australia, other places. But he had never followed a company that had done what Southeastern did over the five-year period of time before he took the business over. So I had basically purchased a decent wrestling operation from a guy named John Kazana uh, that ran only two cities a week. That's all John ran was Knoxville and a little town called Forest, Fort Morristown, about 40 miles outside Knoxville. And, uh, and, and he had a poor quality TV show uh, on a station whose signal 
only reached out about 40 miles out of Knoxville. So the Knoxville matches were being held at this time in the Chilhowee Park facilities. Uh, he had no full-time wrestlers, uh, and uh, n- he only ran. He didn't run six-day-a-week schedule and uh, really didn't want to. So in the five years that I had uh, turned that uh, decent wrestling operation into the best small territory in the world, uh, we had six cities running every week. I dropped a small TV station that he was on. I moved to the biggest TV station in the market. It had a tower and a signal range of at least 125 miles in all directions. And uh, so it was three times further reach than the old station had uh, when I came there. And obviously that's going to make a big difference. Then Les Thatcher and I, uh, who had been friends since the early 1970s, we start in the 19, uh, 1970 when I went to the Florida Territory. Les was there, and he was there for a couple of years. And we spent a lot of time together and uh, talking about you know, television programs. And, uh, you know, if, if, I, if, if, I, if we ever had an opportunity to have our own thing uh, about what we would basically do if we had a TV show. So, uh, you know, so we created uh, basically a uh, almost a perfect television show. We presented that uh, show to the new station, which was uh, soon going to be considered this our TV show as the best wrestling television show in the country. And there was no doubt about it. It really, truly was. So then I left uh, Chilhowee Park's two venues at that point, and I headed for the Knoxville Coliseum, where they had never, it's hard to believe they had never held a wrestling event event before <laughs> ever, before I came there mm-hmm. and where we could put more than 6,000 fans into that beautiful building. And we didn't have to worry about the rain where we were outside and, you know, and having to move into a small building. And, uh, and we began to, right away to broaden the appeal because we were, once we got in the Coliseum, we were basically dealing with a totally different fan base. So then the real work began, uh, finding some of the best wrestlers in the world to work one of the smallest territories in the world and make them enough money to keep them happy and, uh, and to make them not want to leave. That's, that's a pretty big job right there. And, uh, so then, uh, be, I became, you know, uh, then, uh, had a booker and, uh, you know, I had I got my brother finally involved in that situation and to figure out how to use these guys and how to get them over with the fans until we were selling out. Basically, every building of any size in every city we went to, including Knoxville's Coliseum. Mm-hmm. So, so I know for the fact that the Georgia promoters had no idea all of this had happened in five short years. They expected to automatically be able to do just as well as I had, if not better, when they came to Knoxville. And they were also unaware of Cadillac matches that we had, of the cruiser boat tournament, uh, mink coat tournaments, uh, and some of the best NWA World Championship matches and World Junior Heavyweight Championship matches ever seen. Wow. All right. That's a, to me, that's a great explanation of how to build a, a territory in five short years. It was amazing what you had accomplished and I can see where the buyers didn't understand what your fans were accustomed to. So where did it all start going bad for the folks that bought it from you? Well, the Knoxville war obviously was the beginning of the problem to begin with. And then uh, Jim Barnett, he had, he had dealt with a war in Atlanta in the early 1970s, but he didn't recognize the difference between the war in Knoxville and the one in Atlanta where he basically bought out the competition, ended the war by just buying out the other company. So he wasn't going to do that in Knoxville. He had made the decision he was not going to do that in Knoxville because I think he really thought he didn't. He wasn't going to need to. So he thought, I believe, it was going to be very easy to run off these five wrestlers, none of which had ever been huge stars before anywhere other than Knoxville, and he underestimated how over the southeastern stars were. And the destruction of this Knoxville war, uh, how bad it was compared to the Atlanta war. So uh, Barnett came into Knoxville. Basically, once he bought, him, bought me out, 
uh, guns blazing, I guess is a good way to put it. For the first three <laughs> or four months, he spent his weekends in the Hyatt Hotel across the street from Knoxville Coliseum. Mm. He held nothing back. He brought in stars from his own territory, Mr. Wrestling 2, Tony Atlas, Tommy Rich, Bob Armstrong was there because uh, it was at a time when we were down south there and uh, Bob was going to be moving there. He had a home in Marietta. He wanted to go home and to get and sell his house and, and move his family to, to forever to Pensacola. And, uh, and actually, that's what happened eventually here. And uh, so, you know, uh, he had the Hulk. Uh, he had uh, the Mark Lewin. He had Killer Carl Cox. You know, he had a group of great heels. So, uh, and then he started adding superstars to all this, all the Andre the Giant. He brought in the Sheik. He brought in Dick the Bruiser. He brought Terry Funk, who was a big guard in Knoxville in. Nothing worked. They couldn't draw half a house in the Coliseum, no matter who they had on the card. So Barnett grew more disenchanted with each week. Uh, by April, the five months after he took over the the the, uh, the Knoxville uh, territory, he was pretty. He pretty much gave up. You know, he began to send his weaker talent from his Atlanta territory, mm-hmm. including the wrestlers that was going to be on the TV show on Saturdays. Uh, and uh, that was not a good idea. Okay. It doesn't sound too promising. Didn't you say earlier that you had a Knoxville card for June 1980 in the same week as the Southeastern Gulf Coast show coming later? And if so, who was on that card? Well, I do have a Knoxville card. Uh, it was for Friday night, uh, June 6th, 1980. Almost exactly a year from the date that All Star Wrestling had their very first show, uh, and it was seven months after Barnett and Fred Ward had taken possession of the Southeastern Knoxville territory. So we're seven months after they took over. Uh, we're exactly a year from the time that All Star Wrestling started. So the opening match on this Knoxville show was a guy called Ivan the Terrible versus Troy T. Tyler. Uh, the next match was Don Diamond and Terry Taylor versus a team called the Manchurians, managed by the great Mephisto. Austin Idol was wrestling against Dennis Condry. Uh, for the Southeastern title, no DQ match, a guy named Bad News Harris was against a guy named Randy Mountaineer. And in a special challenge grudge match, Mark Lewin was wrestling John Thibodeau. And in a cage match, loser leave. Guy named Steve Jarvis was wrestling Dutch Mantel. <laughs> okay, is it me? But I just hardly recognize any of those guys except for a few names like Austin Idol, Dennis Condry. Those stand out. The Great Mephisto and and Dutch Mantel. That's pretty much it. Well, <laughs> be honest with you, Dave. Uh, growing up in the sport, I know a whole lot of wrestlers, but. But even I have to admit, I don't know very many more of those guys than you do on that entire card. Yeah. yeah. I only know basically two more guys on that card than, than you just mentioned. And one of those is Mark Lewin, who I met in Australia in 73. And another is a guy named Terry Taylor. So with a card like this, I wouldn't think that they could have put more than a thousand fans in the Coliseum. I mean, and, and that would be about a third a third of the smallest crowd we ever drew in the Coliseum in our history. Uh, you know, we, we were, if we had 3,000 people, I considered it to be a bad night. And uh, they're talking about 1,000 here. So in one year, from June of 1979, when the war started, to June of 1980, the sport had become less popular than when I bought it from John Cusana in 1974. So basically, all of my success had been erased in one short year. Now, one more thing I want to add. Uh, My good friend, Ed Harrison, sent me these original cards from the Knoxville newspaper. And uh, and he's going to be sending them to me uh, regularly here so that we can kind of do this a little bit with Knoxville every week. So what really struck me is two things about 
the new southeastern owner's ads. These ads, this is going to, we got an ad coming from the southeastern owners, and then there's an ad that comes from All Star, the, uh, the old uh, Knoxville Five there. So uh, they had changed the structure of the ads entirely, Barnett and his company. And, uh, but uh, worse still, they had absolutely no mention of a TV show, the time, or the channel in their, in their ads for the uh, matches. And that was where you built your business through your, through your TV shows. Mm. If fans watch TV, you had a good chance of success especially if your show was a good show. But uh, if they didn't watch your TV shows, or worse still, didn't even know about it, you had no chance of success. I was going to ask about that earlier, but I felt like you were going to cover that point, and I didn't want to go over it twice. But to me, uh, that, that had to be the, the really the cornerstone of success for what you did in Knoxville. You all, and you, the ratings that you talked about, with an 80 share, I mean, that's 80% of all TV watchers were watching that TV show at one time, which was on, it was a Saturday afternoon, right? Right. Like two o'clock in the afternoon. Two o'clock. Two yeah. O'clock Saturday. So you, you built just an incredible TV audience. And so obviously when they watch the TV show, they want to go to the matches to me that, wow. Okay. But what a simple mistake that was. I mean, did you say earlier you had some information about the Knoxville Five, the all-star wrestling card, the night after this Southeastern card? Yeah, basically, uh, this was the following night after the card that I just uh, talked about with everybody. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ed sent me this ad from the same Knoxville newspaper, uh, and uh, it was in the paper the night after the Knoxville show. And so All-Star had changed uh, where they ran their matches. And they had already done that before I sold out. Uh, they went from uh, one venue into another. And uh, and by the time I look at this card, which is seven months after I left there, they've changed their venue again. And they could not afford to show a park anymore because they're Crowds had gone down, and they weren't doing a thousand people. So they, I don't know how bad they were, but they went below that thousand figure by quite a bit, from what I've heard. And they were running their matches in a place called Evans Collin Field, wherever that was in Knoxville. And uh, and if it rained, they had to move. They're been indoors, and if that happened, they moved to a place that was called. The Lamar Street Gym. Right? <laughs> and, and I heard that place only held 400 people. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, so, you know, wow, their situation is not good, you know. And uh, so they had, they had only five matches compared to the Southeastern six matches. And I only recognized the names on these this card uh, in, in just the top two matches. The, everything below that second match is the two main event, basically, uh, I don't know who in him. Uh, they were still advertising Ronnie Garvin as a Southeastern champion. He was wrestling against Bob Orton Jr. They'd been in business there for exactly one year. This this was 52 weeks from their very first show that they did. And these two guys had to probably been in the main event for 25 of those 50 weeks since, right? I mean, the... <laughs> they're they're a fixture there, and uh, <laughs> how many times can you have the same two guys wrestle each other, and people still want to see it? So the only other names that I recognized uh, was uh, the the tape of the <laughs> first match uh, was a guy named Terry Gibbs <laughs> who had wrestled for me and then went over to uh, work for those guys versus Barry O. Barry O was Bob Orton Jr.'s younger brother, <laughs> so. And, and the rest of that card, I know none of them. Okay, I want to go back. What What about Evans Collins Field, where they advertise their matches? Okay, was it a baseball field? Was it somebody's farm? And, <laughs> <laughs> and where were the other three guys of the Knoxville Five? <laughs> I like that one about somebody's farm, you know? I mean, <laughs> sounds like an Evans <laughs> Collins Field. Yeah. 
So, so I guess the Knoxville Five, uh, they were down from five to two. <laughs> so maybe Ron Wright and wow. the great Malenko and Bob Roop, uh, they had maybe all quit. Wow. You know, I mean, the business was getting worse and worse, not just for them, but for the other company as well. So uh, what I did notice about their newspaper ad was that they did at least put their TV show into the ad. And, and then when I got to looking at the ad, and, and their TV show, uh, I, I, and I noticed that they were on a UHF, a weak signal station, uh, and uh, they were on at 9 p.m. on Monday night and 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday. They didn't even have a weekend show on Saturday or Sunday. Wow. So, so no wonder they were dead. And that, and that meant that TV stations knew wrestling was dead as well. Mm. Stations kept up with business, and the, and they knew that we were doing great business when we were there. And uh, you know, and uh, obviously the Georgia promoters, uh, once they got a hold of it, uh, the TV ratings started going down, down, down. I don't know where they went from eighty, but they might have gone to down as as low as forty, wow. a forty rating. So, uh, so I think they were just hanging on for dear life. Uh, and uh, basically, these all-star guys, which were down to basically two of them now, uh, they were, I think, hoping Jim Barnett was going to do what he did in Atlanta and <laughs> buy them out. And uh, But it didn't happen. Wow. So seeing these cards and realizing what had happened in the one year since the Knoxville Ward started, I had no doubt I made the right decision to sell out when I did. I don't think I could have handled on a weekly basis, experiencing the demise of the territory I had created over that five-year period of time, having to go there in that coliseum and see those tiny cards <laughs> uh, and tiny crowds. I mean, I don't know if I, I could have dealt with that, Dave. Wow. I mean, this is really a fascinating subject, that I love to hear these the behind-the-scenes stories. This kind of hidden history, fans will find no place but right here on the Studcast. That's really cool. So, uh, you know, we're going to continue this process, uh, and we're going to briefly be uh, pretty much every week for a while uh, revisiting Knoxville, at least to see what the cards were for both those companies. And because this is such a, a tragic and historic story, I mean, uh, wow, I, it, it needs to be covered. And over the next couple of years, the Georgia promoters were going to sell out to Ric Flair and Blackjack Mulligan. They've sold that territory they bought from me. A Flair and Mulligan were associated with the Crockett family, and, and their mid-Atlantic territory was by the other side of the Smoky Mountains, uh, which was based in Charlotte, North Carolina. But with all of Crockett's great talent and uh, and Flair and Mulligan owning it and bringing in guys from everywhere they could think of, they weren't. They were still unable to revive in the southeastern Knoxville territory. Mm. All right, I had no idea Rick Flair, an NWA World Champion, was ever involved in owning a territory. I may recall you talking about that in the past, but this story just keeps getting better. All right, before our break, can you give us what the? Let's go south to the Southeastern Gulf Coast Territory. Give us the card for the second week in June that we've been talking about today. Let's do that. Okay, so, uh, you know, we're just uh, starting a change in some talent uh, in, the, in, the, in our territory here in Southeastern on the Gulf Coast, and we were beginning a talent change. And the card was another great card, man, and it opened up with Charlie Cook, versus the Cuban assassin, who had just been there a couple of weeks. Uh, then we got, we wanted having the debut, man, of the 6-foot, 10-inch, 430-pound plowboy Frazier with his valet, called Floyd, top, who was going to be uh, towering over Burhead Jones, his opponent. Uh, the third match was a special challenge match. After what happened the week before when Norvell lost the Texas death match on TV that cost him a shot at Tony Charles for the United States Junior Heavyweight title. And then he then showed up at the arena uh, on the night that 
Charles is defending against Jerry Stubbs rather than Norvell uh, in that title match. And uh, Jerry Stubbs had demanded the match uh, with uh, Austin, with Norvell Austin, uh, and the winner of that match was going to get a shot at Tony Charles in the belt the following week. So a uh, lot going on in this this deal with uh, Tony Charles and these junior heavyweights. Uh, the fourth match was the United States junior title match with the champion, Tony Charles, defending against a visitor, a great friend of Rob and I from the Florida Territory, Mike Graham. And for the Southeastern Championship, the Mongolian Stomper, normally managed by the Big C, was not going to have his manager in the corner for this one. Big C was barred from ringside, and I was getting the shot at the title. And for the Southeastern Tag Championship, the champions, Randy Rose and Dr. Bill Irwin, who were managed by the Big C, were facing Robert Fuller and Eddie Boulder. And this was going to be the end of one of those teams for sure, because the man who lost the match uh, in this tag match was going to have to leave Southeastern. Uh, the last match was a lumberjack match with wrestlers surrounding the ring to keep the contestants in. Uh, we had Big Ron Bass, managed by the Big C, taking on Bob Armstrong. Wow, that's a great card. Another big seven-match card with two new stars, Plowboy Frazier and Mike Graham. All right, when we return after the break, Ron, we're going to get you to give us the information and set up the TV show which is always, I mean, that's what sets up the big cards in the Coliseums down south, juxtaposed to the sadness that was going on in Knoxville. All right, so let's do that when we come back and talk about the TV show down south when this Studcast continues. Okay, Studcast fans, Ron rarely talks about his thrilling novel, Brutus, but it's become one of the hottest books in the world. Hard to imagine a wrestler as an author, especially of a novel that has nothing to do with the wrestling. Want to know more about Brutus? Go to Amazon Novel Brutus and find out what more than 70 readers think in their personal reviews. It's often compared to Jaws for a reason. You get yours now at tnstud.com. Click on Stud Store. Get the book for only $20 or the personally autographed copy by the stud himself for only $30. For a totally different ride than the one you're getting in this studcast, saddle up for suspense with Brutus. All right, Studcast fans, welcome back in. Let's get into part two of this Studcast, number 354, 354 of these Studcasts. This one is called Bob and Bass Lumberjack, Knoxville Dying. Well, we've obviously heard about Knoxville dying up to where we are in the story. So, Ron, we had a great first part of this Studcast talking about going back to Tennessee for a review of what's been happening there since you sold Knoxville, you had it you had it set up doing very well once you sold it, and then it just sort of died on the vine. So now we're back. Let's go to the Gulf Coast where things are a little more uplifting with a really good card that you described moments ago for the second week of June 1980. So how did that TV show begin? Well, Charlie opened with it at the set uh, with the Southeastern Tag Champions. Randy Rose and Dr. Bill Irwin and their manager, Big C, uh, who had finally apologized to Charlie on the last show. Uh, Charlie and, and, and Big C were kind of speaking together, speaking again. So, uh, you know, uh, they ended up uh, right there with him at the beginning of this show. The Big C did all the talking, obviously, as was always the case. And uh, they watched a video from the, from the week before where his team beat Eddie Boulder in the championship uh, Texas death match. That was where we had three Texas death matches on one card. Uh, and they, sh they were watching uh, the match in which Eddie Boulder got beat for them in the Texas death match. Big C had basically asked Commissioner Don Curtis earlier in the week. I'm sure he called him and had a conversation. He asked him uh, for a very unusual championship match. Uh, a match in which the loser of the match had to leave Southeastern, a loser of the fall. So you didn't have both of the team, the entire team leaving. You just had the one guy that lost the, uh, lost the match. Uh, but that actually is going to change your team 
for, for good, or at least for a year. So Big C asked Charlie if uh, Don Curtis had made a decision on that request yet. And, uh, and Charlie informed him that, uh, yes, that, uh, that the day before that he, he had got a call from, from a Don Curtis, and, uh, and he said the Don Dirk Curtis uh, told him that uh, he should tell you that uh, he, he has, he's going to grant your request, basically. And he goes, uh, but, uh, you know, there's one little hitch to it, Charlie Wood, to tell him Big C's all happy hot dog. This is a great band, and we're going to get rid of him. And then he says, uh, but there's one little hitch to it. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to be allowed at ringside for the match. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so Big C exploded, man, uh, and he started screaming insults at Don Curtis, uh, asking Charlie why Curtis added him. You know, added him being barred from ringside. What do you ask him for? Why would he do something like that? You know, and uh, and that anger and res- response to, <laughs> from Big C that just made the studio audience. They loved that boy, so they got into it and they're all clapping and, and cheering for the fact that uh, you know he's not going to be able to be at ringside for the match. So then uh, Charlie invited them, you know, to to stay at the set and comment on the first match of the day. Uh, Big C shouted, you know, uh, absolutely not. He said, because, you know, he said, being barred from ringside, you know, for this kind of event now, he goes, you know, I mean, now if one of my men lose, he goes, I might not only lose the championship belt, but I'm going to lose one of my men, too, right? So, so Charlie being, you know, he still wasn't over is a problem with with uh, Big C. Uh, Charlie <laughs> asked him, he said, well, the, don't you think maybe you shouldn't have asked for that kind of match? You know, and that <laughs> got another big applause from the crowd. <laughs> and then, the, the, you know, that uh, but Big C couldn't take it any longer, man. So uh, Charlie the, told the ring announcer to ring the bell for the first match, and uh, Big C, he just got his boys and, you know, he was still screaming about it on the way out of the, off the set. And Rob and Eddie Boulder were going with the ring. And the, they were both laughing at him then. Rob, they got into the ring, and they were like the fans in the studio. They were laughing at Big C because he couldn't take what was going on. And, uh, and they started uh, calling the three of them the three stooges. <laughs> and, uh, and then the studio picked up the chant, the three stooges. And, oh, now Big C, he's going down. See, he's not a good start for him. All right, so it sounds like the show is off to a really great start. Yeah, uh, you know, and, uh, and then the, when the first match ended, uh, Rob and Eddie, they both ended their opponents at the same time. A great little match. And, uh, you know, they were a good team. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the, we had to see where we're going after this. All right, what about the next TV segment? Set that one up for us. Well, I was at the set with Charlie for this one when it opened up and uh, we watched the video from days earlier where I was wrestling the Mongolian Stomper in the Southeastern Championship Texas death match from the week before where the Big C obviously was entirely to blame for, for my loss and uh, and the way it happened was the referee and Stomper were both down in the ring they had collided as me and the Stomper collided I went out onto the concrete and Stomper flew back into the referee, and the referee and Stomper were down in the ring. Me on the outside, there stands Big C. He just walks over, loads up his black glove, and I don't see him. I get up, I start trying to get back in the ring, and he nails me from behind. And uh, and then he just went back to the dressing room. He knew he, <laughs> he made this. And this one was over, and uh, so obviously the referee got up. He counted me out. Uh, then he rang the bell, he, and he counted to ten. I wasn't able to get back into the ring, so uh, the Stomper ended up uh, winning that Texas death match. All right, so all right, set up the second TV match for us, Dud. Well, before I give you the answer to that question, I need to explain what happened next on at the set with Charlie and I. Uh, Charlie told me, you know, because Don Curtis had seen this video, the one that I'm just talking about that we watched. And he said, I was getting a, going to get another Southeastern Championship match the coming week. And uh, Don Curtis had made my match 
the exact same rules as the match with my brother and Eddie Boulder against Rose and Irwin for the tag belts. And so I asked Charlie, I said, do you mean the Big C is going to be banned from ringside for my match, just like he's banned for the tag match? And Charlie said, absolutely. And the TV popped again, <laughs> man. They, it wasn't a, being a good, it wasn't a good day for the Big C. All right. So what about that second TV match? Who was in it? Someone that exploded louder than the studio and I <laughs> was in it. The, the big C and the Mongolian stomper. And uh, they busted out of the dressing room door. And for a change, it wasn't the big C chasing his stomper around uh, the studio. But this time, uh, it was his stomper chasing big C. Big C was headed to the set. And I'm sitting there, you know, and... Uh, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs, uh, Don Curtis can't do this to me. You know? <laughs> and the matter Big C got, the more the studio roared. I mean, it was pandemonium again, but it wasn't like the Stomper running around there creating it. This time it was the Big C creating it. So uh, Stomper drug him basically away from the set, <laughs> got him by the shoulder, come on, and took him, and went to the ring, got in the ring. They were supposed to be wrestling, and he made... The big C get in there with him. And, uh, you know, I'd never seen Don Carson that bad. I mean, he, and, he, and he quickly rubbed off on the stomper, and, boy, the stomper annihilated his opponent. Wow. I mean, and Charlie and I, you know, I had a great time at the set laughing about the big C getting the match he asked Don Curtis for, but he got a lot more than he asked Don Curtis he, for. He, uh, now, that is a great start to a TV show. All right, let's let's do the personality profile. Let's let's hear about that. Well, it was built around Southeastern, uh, the company itself, and and what was becoming it, and and did this just kind of happened out of nowhere? This territory was becoming the hottest territory in the world, especially for junior heavyweight wrestlers. Uh, Tony Charles uh, deserved the credit basically for most of that because he was the United States junior heavyweight champion. And, uh, and he was such a great wrestler. And uh, so Charlie had, uh, had, uh, had him on the profile, Tony Charles. Uh, and they discussed the junior heavyweights that had recently left Southeastern. Uh, it had been, we had been flooded with junior heavyweights. You had Dick Steinborn and Don Fargo, both junior heavyweights. And uh, both of those guys had lost one match. <laughs> And, and both of them had to leave in that same match. It was one of those three-man matches. And so they were gone. And uh, they then then they talked about uh, Norvell Austin and, uh, you know, what a great uh, junior heavyweight he is. And then another one had just joined, come back uh, out of nowhere the week before, Jerry Stubbs. And uh, so they were all there because of basically the great champion that Tony Charles was. So Charlie and Tony talked about the passion of these junior heavyweight stars in the Southeast. Uh, Dick Steinborn and Don Fargo had battled each other big time for the opportunity to see who's going to wrestle uh, Charles for the championship. And both were eliminated in the same night. And how Norvell Austin won the U.S. junior belt from Tony four weeks earlier uh, and before he lost it back to the champion. And now there was this new junior heavyweight star, Jerry Stubbs, uh, that uh, got his first shot at the champ last week. And that match was a subject, uh, you know, that they were going to be talking about for the today's personality profile. So what they did is they watched a video from Mobile, Alabama, which was recorded four days early of the junior heavyweight championship match between Tony Charles and Jerry Stubbs. And, uh, and it was a match that uh, Norvell Austin – Believed he deserved, <laughs> and, and he kind of did because he had won a match that promised him a championship match, but then he got beat on a Texas death match the week before on television, and uh, Stubbs got the match instead of him. So uh, Austin, you know, believed uh, passionately that, you know, uh, that he, he deserved the match, and he wasn't even booked on the card, on this card, but out of nowhere, Stubbs got Charles beat in the middle of the ring, and out of nowhere, Norvell Austin shows up. He comes dressed in his street clothes, climbs up on the top rope, jumps off and stubs back, uh, pile drives a, a, a champion and uh, leaves them both laying there. And then he just left the building. 
So uh, Charlie and the studio audience, uh, they had never seen this before. They were shocked, man. <laughs> what the heck was that all about? So this incident led to this upcoming match that we're going to have the next week with Jerry Stubbs, now against Norvell Austin again. And this time, the winner of the match the following week was going to wrestle Tony Charles for the United States junior title. So, but before that match, Tony was defending against another junior heavyweight challenger. Uh, so you're going to have Stubbs against Austin. So uh, Tony Charles going to defend his title against the son of Eddie Graham, Mike Graham. Uh, we're going to be coming and spending a week with Rob and I. He used to do it in, uh, when we were in Knoxville. He wanted to come and spend a week with us. And uh, so he got a ch- shot to wrestle Tony Charles while he was there. So Charlie and Tony, you know, they watched a one-minute interview from Mike Graham that was recorded in Tampa at the old sportatorium there uh, where they did TV every Wednesday with Gordon Soley. And Mike was certainly another passionate junior heavyweight. There was no doubt about that. Mike was definitely 100% into wrestling. Tony was uh, very familiar with Mike. And, uh, of course, Tony had wrestled in that Florida territory himself for a couple of years prior to that. Wow. I, I really don't remember having so many great junior heavyweight wrestlers in Southeastern all at one time. I think that was really cool. Well, you know, and the, and the thing about it was, Dave, that it's not over. I mean, especially during this time frame, mm-hmm. uh, coming soon, within the next few weeks here, we're going to have two more new great junior heavyweights, uh, Sweet Brown Sugar. And uh, the Pensacola born and raised hometown boy, Ricky Gibson, coming home. So the profile ended with some big news for Tony. Now, he'd seen all this. He sees all these young guys. He, he knows that all of them are after his belt. And uh, so Charlie ends the profile with a bit of good news for Tony. And Charlie told him that in the month of August, which was only two months away, mm-hmm. Southeastern was bringing in the world junior heavyweight champion, Les Thornton. And hopefully that uh, you, Tony, would be getting the shot at the world title. Mm-hmm. Tony lit up like a Christmas tree. Wow. All right. Every, I, every time I think this has to be the best personality profile so far, you end up topping it. All right. That was really phenomenal. All right. So what was next on the TV show? Well, we were going to be uh, you know, going from junior heavyweights uh, to super heavyweights. I mean, uh, this profile was followed by a newcomer, first time that fans had ever seen it, uh, making his first appearance ever in Southeastern. He was one of the biggest men to ever wrestle in Southeastern or any other territory, one of the biggest men in wrestling. Uh, And, uh, you know, so uh, he he was from Philadelphia, Mississippi. He was six feet, 10 inches tall, weighed 430 pounds. Uh, he was called Plowboy Frazier, and uh, <laughs> wow, did he, he he wowed that studio crowd. I mean, when he walked through the door, they couldn't stop buzzing, man. Wow, uh, this is his immense size, you know. And he was truly an old country boy, uh, you know. Uh, he wore the overalls, and he had a valet, a guy named Floyd, that drove him <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> Because he was too big to get behind the steering wheel of any kind of vehicle. I bet. Oh he couldn't drive God. his own cars. Yeah. You know, so he had a valet, and uh, and his valet wore overalls, too. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> they were both country boys. So, uh, obviously, his match didn't last long. But uh, when he had splashed his opponent at the end of the match, man, I don't care who you were. You were going to have a hard time believing that that didn't hurt. <laughs> You know, I mean, he hurt, he hurt one guy that day for sure. Oh, I, I do remember him. You mentioned overalls. I definitely remember that. He was absolutely huge, almost as big as I, I was thinking about Andre when you were talking about him. So where did you find him? Well, Robert find him, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I, got, I guess I'll have to say somewhere. I never really asked him, where'd you find this guy? Mm-hmm. You no. Know, and, and he had worked obviously, uh, not this wasn't his first time as a wrestler. He had already wrestled some in the Memphis territory. He'd wrestled in WWF in New York, wow. up in New York. And, wow. Uh, 
And uh, wow, they loved those monster wrestlers up there in that territory. You know, they, they didn't care whether they could wrestle or not. They just liked to see these big, huge guys. All right. Did you have him at one of the big at the house shows the 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 in the three big cities? Oh yeah, he's on that card. Well, <laughs> obviously, when they saw him on TV, they were like, "Okay, we've got to go to the matches to see this thing, this monster in person." That's uh, that's incredible. All right, so how did the TV show end? Bob Armstrong, uh, you know, uh, he got it off to a good start. All he had to do, basically, was go to the set and the crowd lit up, man. Uh, you know, he, they loved him. And he and Charlie, uh, they watched the video of the Texas death match that he had had in Mobile four days earlier. And, uh, and where he was, again, against uh, Ron Bass. And it ended with the Big C getting involved. Uh, and then Robert went to the ring to help Bob, and that brought Randy Rose and Dr. Bill Irwin down to the ring. That brought Jerry Stubbs and Charlie Cook and some others, and and until the there were so many people at the ring and and half of them men and half of them fighting on the floor that the referee didn't have any choice but to stop the match. Uh, oh, uh, he he had lost control, and uh, and it wasn't his fault. So Bob and Bass were going to be returning against each other, and that's what we're going to be talking. We just talked about it in this week, uh, this week's card, uh, the Lumberjack match, uh, and they were going to be wrestlers surrounding the ring to throw the two of them back in uh, when they got out and tried to leave. <laughs> All right, so let's move to the last TV match. Set that, set that one up for us. Well, Big Ron Bass, man. Uh, it was Big old Ron, and uh, he, he came to the ring. Well, not only the big C, but he brought his bow rope with the steel bell attached to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the small, same bull rope that he had used basically on Joe LaDuke two weeks in a row, two months earlier. Uh, and Joe suffered back-to-back -back concussions, and, and that had sent Joe home to Canada. Hadn't seen Joe in two months because of what uh, Ron Bass did with that bull rope before. So Bob Armstrong had stayed at the set with Charlie to watch these guys because that's who he's wrestling, commentate over the match. And Bass was focusing big time on challenging Bob and swinging his bull rope all over the ring. And, uh, and he certainly didn't need the bull rope to get a win on TV, especially with, uh, you know, nobody was going to beat Bass on TV. And uh, Bass and the Stomper, uh, they were uh, – it, they were they had been joined basically on this TV show by the third big heel. Uh, you know, you had Stomper, you had Bass. Now you got uh, wow, this huge, huge country boy, uh, yeah. and uh, you know, you got three big wrestlers, big heels in the territory at this point. Wow, I mean, that's how you end a TV show in a frenzy and everybody's like, holy cow, I can't wait for the matches in the arena. All right. So what happened in the arenas the following week? Well, Charlie Cook didn't have any trouble at all beating the Cuban assassin. Charlie Cook's been really staying down on the lower part of the card, but he's going to get an opportunity to move up uh, pretty quickly too. Uh, nor, uh, you know, and obviously, Plowboy Frazier didn't have any problem beating Burhead Jones. Uh, and then obviously, uh, Burhead got squashed, just like the guy on TV had. Uh, Jerry Stubbs and Norvell Lawson, they wrestled to a, a very exciting 30-minute time limit draw. These two guys could wrestle. They were stars. And uh, they got the, neither of them, neither of them got the shot at Tony Charles that this match was, if you won this match, you were going to get the championship match against Tony. Well, obviously, they didn't get that because they had a time limit draw. So they're going to be coming back against each other on this next card. And uh, next time, uh, there would be a no time limit match when they met. And the winner was assured of getting that shot at the U.S. junior title after Mike Graham gets a shot at uh, Tony Charles in this upcoming uh, event. So Tony Charles uh, successfully defended his belt against Mike Grant. Uh, the Big C, uh, they didn't come. They didn't come to the ring with the Mongolian Stomper uh, for the Southeastern Championship match. Uh, that's what 
Curtis had said, you know, we're going to let you uh, have your type of match, but you're not going to be at the ringside. And the Mongolian stomper managed to get himself disqualified. You know, I had him going. I had him in the corner. I was rifling him with some punches, and uh, and I'm already standing up on the second rope, and he just dumped me straight over the top rope out onto the floor, and uh, that was a disqualification. And my hand got raised, but I certainly didn't get the belt. Uh, Big C didn't show up at the ring uh, for the Southeastern Tag Championship, like uh, Curtis had said. Uh, the one in which the loser of the fall is going to have to leave Southeastern. And wow, what a great match that was, man. And the team of Randy Rose and Dr. Bill Irwin, they got the win over Eddie Boulder. And uh, Eddie was the third wrestler in the last three weeks to have to leave Southeastern in the loser leave match. The last match was between Ron Bass and Bob Armstrong. It was a lumberjack match. Uh, the ring surrounded by wrestlers that had everyone uh, and, and everyone and every building that we went to on their feet, all the lumberjacks ended up fighting each other, basically on one side of the ring, which drew the referee's attention away from the actual two that were in the event, Armstrong and Bass. Uh, he went to try to get the, some type of control of what was going on on the floor with lumberjacks. And uh, for the first time in the night, the big C sneaked down to the ring. He brought Bass's bull rope and he passed it to him. And then he went back to the dressing room. Uh, Bass never got to use it, though. The referee saw Bass with the rope <laughs> and he stopped the match. And the uh, following week, Ron Bass is going to finally get his chance. He's going to be the first official Bass uh, bull rope match in Southeastern history against Bob Armstrong. Uh, Bob's going to be strapped on one end and Bass on the other. And, uh, wow, these bull rope matches are, are not a good thing to be in, man, if, if you don't want to get hurt. So they're both strapped on, on opposite ends of the bull rope, and they're connected. And they got a big old steel bell right in the middle of that rope. Wow. So- yeah, you use uh, any way you want to. I I swear I think I've seen I I think I saw that match. I know I've seen one of those before, and it might have been that one. I can't imagine any place in America where they were seeing this type of match. So how about the attendances in those three major wrestling cities? Well, it was exactly the same total as the week before. Basically, Montgomery was down only about a hundred people to forty five hundred forty six. Dothan was up a hundred. From four from five thousand to fifty one hundred, and Mobile just did what the building would hold, which was it would it had gotten to be the every week thing fifty six hundred. That's going to be it, and uh, the fire marshal stayed on top of that and never let it get much above that fifty six hundred. Wow! But it was still fifteen thousand two hundred fans in those three cities alone. Wow! All right, I got to tell you, this has been another thrilling studcast. I'm sorry to say we we don't have enough time for a learning tree question today, but hopefully we'll get back to that next week. All right. We touched on what had been happening in the Knoxville market over the last six months. So I guess we're going to be doing, doing more of that each week. I think that's a good thing for the Knoxville fans, especially of the studcast Southeastern Gulf coast was still on fire and appeared to be going, going to stay that way. So where where will we ride next week? And is Knoxville involved next week too? Uh, yeah, we're going to be we we'll have another southeastern Knoxville card, and we're also going to have an All Star card, so we can c- kind of compare what both of those two companies are doing in Knoxville. And also, we're going to have another hidden history lesson, uh, and then we're going to do the first bull rope match in southeastern Gulf Coast history with another loser leaves tag match. Uh, after this one in which we lost uh, Eddie Boulder, we're going to come back with another tag match in which the loser is going to have to leave. Uh, we'll have a definitely different team, obviously, against uh, the team that the champions of the big seats. We'll have the introduction of a special new heel that's going to take the United States junior heavyweight champion, Tony Charles. Uh, and there's so much more coming in these these upcoming studcasts too, Dave. Oh, I absolutely believe that. Hey, folks, you know the deal on Facebook. You can find Ron at Ron Fuller, the Tennessee stud. Like and follow him there. Automatically become friends 
with a living legend. Ron always responds to comments, and you can even send him a note occasionally. I'm sure he wouldn't mind that if you if you have questions. Twitter or X, he's at Ron Fuller Welch. Follow him there on Twitter or X. You can also check out the fantastic website, tnstud.com. This studcast is going to be there with every studcast ever done. Shop the stud store where you can get 43 super stud casts, four different 8x10 photos, the thrilling lion novel called Brutus, personally autographed to you, and t-shirts still on sale. The t-shirt's only $15.99. That's the Christmas price. What are you talking about? It's almost July, but that's understandable. All with free shipping. And subscribe to Ron's YouTube channel, Southeastern Rewind. When you go to YouTube, start putting in the word South. It's the first thing that comes up. Southeastern Rewind. Find hundreds and, uh, I mean, hundreds of hours of classic old school wrestling entertainment. 429 total videos. The last 133 studcast. 16 Ask the Stud shows and 115 short rides with the stud. You can go back one year or more and discover fantastic stud stories about worldwide stars. 23 studcast archive stories. 23 tell me more fan question shows. Superstars of the past shows and much more. I got to tell you, I did some research for Ron recently, checking on numbers, and there are a ton of videos there. It's YouTube, Southeastern Rewind. It is the best deal in wrestling, and it's free on YouTube, Southeastern Rewind. All right, another great show. Any final comments, Stud? Well, I'd just like to, you know, uh, pass along a big thanks to everyone that wished me Happy Father's Day. Uh, I had a great time of uh, doing one of those when wrestling was wrestling with my with my father. Uh, wow, uh, as, as a tribute to my dad. I want to thank uh, everybody for listening today, and I hope you've enjoyed it out there. And please take care of yourselves and others, and may God bless us all. For Ron Fuller in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee, I'm David Summers saying thank you for listening. Find me at David Summers Productions at gmail.com. This studcast is a David Summers production for Tennessee Stud, LLC. Thanks for joining us today for this historic studcast. The true story continues next week. So full Nelson, your friends, and point them in our direction for another ride with the Tennessee Stud. One, two, three. This is David Summers saying so long from the Great Smoky Mountains.